Hello, and welcome to the session on how to build a safe advanced AI with Evan Hubinger and Atia Bergel. I'm Anjali, and I'll be the MC for the session. We'll start with a 30 minute talk by Evan, followed by a 15 minute talk by Atia. Then we'll move on to a live Q&A session where they'll respond to some of your questions. You can submit questions using the box to the right hand side of this video. You can also vote for your favorite questions to push them up higher on this list. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers for this session. Evan Hubinger is a research fellow at MIRI working on solving inner alignment for iterated amplification. Prior to joining MIRI, Evan was an AI safety research intern at OpenAI and author on Risks from Learned Optimization in Advanced Machine Learning Systems, a MIRI intern, designed the functional programming language Coconut, and did software engineering at Google, Yelp, and Ripple. Evan has a BS in math and computer science from Harpy Mudd College. Here's Evan. Hello all, my name is Evan. I am a research fellow at the Machine Intelligence Research Institute. And I'm going to be talking about how to build a safe advanced AI. Or, well, so not quite. So I don't know the solution to AI safety, but I am going to be talking about how we think we might build a safe advanced AI. So there's a lot of proposals out there, sort of different people working in the field and different possible ways that we might be able to build a safe advanced AI that is you know, very powerful and in, and in fact sort of doing what we want. This is what we're trying to achieve in AI safety. There's a lot of different people with different ideas for how we might go about doing that. So I'm gonna be trying to talk about some of those ideas, go through some of those different possibilities for how we might in fact build a safe advanced AI. So the first thing that uh, I want to go over is what does a proposal for building safe advanced AI mean? What are the sort of necessary components that any proposal sort of needs to address? I'm going to go over four. So the first one that I want to talk about is outer alignment. Outer alignment is fundamentally the question of if we are training a model, and in the standard machine learning paradigm, uh, when we sort of produce an AI, we have some objective, some loss function, reward function. They were trying to produce a model, some sort of neural network or whatever, to achieve and that uh, sort of objective, to sort of minimize that loss, maximize that reward. And outer alignment is the question of, is the thing we're trying to train it on? Is that objective, the loss function, whatever, is it aligned? If the thing was really trying to achieve that loss function or whatever, would we like the result? Would that be a good thing? Uh, a standard sort of problem that falls under this heading that you might be familiar with is the sort of paperclip maximizer problem. If I give an AI the uh, sort of task of maximizing the paperclip output of my paperclip factory, it might sort of as a result just sort of tile the world with tons of paperclip factories, producing lots of paperclips. This is a really good way to make a bunch of paperclips. And so we would say that the objective of producing paperclips is not outer line. All right. So now the second question is inner alignment. Inner alignment is the sort of second piece that we need when we're talking about building an AI via machine learning, which is how do we actually ensure that the training procedure results in a model which is actually trying to do the thing, the objective that we're training on. We have this sort of classically, we do this gradient and descent process where we try to find a model which is trying to you know, achieve some loss function or word function. Rather. An inner alignment is the question of, did, did that work? Did we actually get a model which is trying to do the right thing? Um, and so these are the sort of two components of alignment, the two components of how do we ensure that this sort of uh, proposal actually produces a model which is doing the right thing, or at least trying to do the right thing. And then we sort of have two components for competitiveness, uh, where competitiveness is sort of more about, is the model, is this sort of approach actually one which would be feasible to implement and worthwhile to implement? So first we have training competitiveness, which is how hard is this proposal to do? Uh, if you're sort of DeepMind and you're trying to pitch this proposal to DeepMind, would DeepMind be, have the resources to do this efficiently and effectively? Would this be a thing which like current tools and like our ability, like what we predict maybe in the future to be able to produce like all of the different possible uh, sort of machine learning tools we might have in the future, will they be capable of actually doing this? And then we have performance competitiveness, which is the other sort of second component of competitiveness that I want to talk about, which is how effective, uh, how powerful is the AI system that results from this proposal? If it actually works, if it all goes through, if we like in fact produce a, a sort of powerful AI system, how powerful is it? Would it be able to do all of the tasks that we might want to, an AI to be able to do? Uh, 
um, it's sort of not useful if we just sort of produce an AI that can't actually do anything. And so even, even if that AI doesn't kill us, even if it's aligned, we still want it to like uh, actually be able to do things in the world. That's why we're building an AI in the first place. All right, so these are the sort of four basic components. Now it's important to note that I don't have any of the answers here. I don't claim to sort of know the answer for any of these proposals about whether it actually uh, successfully addresses each of these components. It's just a list of various things to think about and to consider when you're sort of looking at any individual proposal for how to address the sort of overall uh, AI safety problem. All right, so with that in mind, here are the four proposals that we'll be talking about in this talk. Um, it's worth noting that there are a bunch of other proposals that I'm not going to be talking about, but that if you're interested in them, you can find them in the post, which I sort of, in, at the bottom, you can see that the title of it, uh, you can sort of find that I think it should be linked along with this talk. All right, so we're going to start with uh, an approach called imitative amplification. All right, so to understand imitative amplification, I first have to sort of have a bit of a digression and try to talk about a couple of important concepts which are going to be really useful when we talk about imitative amplification. The first one is something called HCH. So HCH is a recursive acronym, which actually, which stands for Humans Consulting HCH. So a little bit weird. Uh, and I'll explain why that makes sense and how that works. But we'll start with a very simple setup, which is I have a human and that human takes in a question and produces an answer. This is sort of you know, a very simple setup. It's just a human answering questions. Uh, and I'm gonna add something. I'm gonna allow that human to talk to two other humans when producing their answer. So we sort of have a group of humans where there's the one human, which is trying to sort of, uh, sort of the leader is, is, is in charge of producing the answer, but they get to ask questions to and consult with two other people that are sort of helping them out. And so this, is, this is great. And this is sort of you know, how a group might sort of answer questions. Uh, but now I want to sort of recurse this procedure. And I want to give each of those humans that the original human is consulting with access to their own humans to consult. And so we're sort of building up this tree. We have a human at the top who's consulting with some other people and they're each consulting with other people um, and then keep going. So HCH is the sort of theoretical object that is the limit of this recursion infinitely. That's sort of if we just keep allowing the human to consult with other humans and so on uh, to produce this sort of infinite tree of humans. We sort of recall this result, this sort of the whole thing, HCH. Uh, and this is a sort of theoretical object, but it's going to be important to our analysis later on. All right, now the second thing which I need to sort of explain is amplification. So what is amplification? So I'm gonna start with a similar setup. I have a human, they get a question and they produce an answer. But now, uh, similarly pre to previously, I want to have the human consult with uh, something else, uh, but instead of consulting with a human this time, I want them to consult with a model, some AI. Uh, which we will call M. And so the human takes in some question, they get to sort of maybe, you know, type some things out to an AI, get some answers back. And then with the ability to consult this AI, they produce an answer, okay. Um, and I want to call this sort of box here where you have the human consulting the model, AMP M, which is to say the amplification operator applied to the model M, where the amplification operator is the procedure that takes the model and sees what happens when a human is given access to that model. And the idea behind this is that it sort of increases, amplifies the capabilities of the model M. Because you know what it's not just what M can do on its own, it's what multiple copies of M can do when sort of organized and deployed by a human. And so this is a sort of key piece of imitative amplification is this sort of amplification operator. All right, so now what is imitative amplification? What does it do? Well. Fundamentally, we want to train our model M to imitate, that is sort of copy the behavior of the amplified version of that very same M. So you can sort of see this sort of happening on the, on the right. We have an initial model M0. M0 is amplified into this model AMP M0, the sort of green arrow you could read as amplification. And this new AMP M0, recall, is a human consulting M0. But then we take M0 and we train it to match the behavior of, a hu of the sort of human consulting itself. That's this gray arrow where the sort of cyan arrow is the imitation loss. And this produces a new model M1. We then amplify this new model M1 and we repeat the procedure. We train M1 to copy the amplified version of itself. 
Uh, and this is a little bit weird, but we'll try to unroll this and understand what's going on in all of it. But there's another important piece here as well, which is in addition to training to sort of mimic uh, the amplified model, we also want to allow the amplified model to sort of inspect the training process and look at the model and make sure it's training in the right way. Um, and so this is the sort of oversight that we want to have in addition that should help us in terms of uh, some inner alignment stuff. We'll talk about that as well. All right. So first, let's try to address what is the sort of limiting behavior of this? What is happening with this sort of weird recursive imitation? So if we take a look at this sort of picture, we have these sequence of models and they're trained to sort of mimic the amplified versions. Uh, we'll try to imagine what happens in the limit. What happens if each of these training processes is sort of perfect? And so if they're perfect, then we can just sort of equate, well, if M1 is trained to approximate the amplified version of M0, well, if we imagine sort of in the limit, we get this sort of perfect approximation. M1 is just equal to amplified M0. Um, and then if we have this, we can sort of expand, we can sort of substitute in amp M0 everywhere where we see M1, uh, and similarly for M2. And we get that sort of M3, after we've sort of done this procedure three times, is equivalent to the amplified version of the amplified version of the amplified version of M0. Um, what does that even mean? So let's, let's sort of expand that to try to understand what, what we're looking at after we've done three iterations. So we're trying to understand what is M3. We can see that, first of all, we know M3 is, there's an amplification operator up top. And if you recall, the amplification operator just refers to a human consulting whatever is inside. And so whatever is inside is amp, amp, M0. So we have H consulting amp, amp, M0. And then we can sort of unroll this further. What is amp, amp, M0? Well, that's just a human consulting amp, M0. Uh, and we can sort of unroll this again. And we get that after three iterations, we've built up sort of three levels of what you'll recall is the HCH tree. So we have a human consulting two humans, and those humans are consulting two other humans that are then consulting this sort of initial model M0. And the idea is that if we sort of do this uh, sort of in the limit, if we keep doing this procedure over and over again, we should get closer and closer to the theoretical object, this HCH tree, because we're getting closer and closer to the sort of limit of many, many copies, the sort of infinite tree depth of sort of humans consulting humans, consulting humans, and so on. All right, so this is sort of the goal of imitating amplification is to get to this HCH. So now we can try to understand how does amplification score on some of these different properties that we're trying to sort of uh, gauge for each of these proposals. So for outer alignment and performance competitiveness, because outer alignment and performance competitiveness are about sort of what would actually happen at the end, what is the sort of, uh, if we actually manage to get a, a model which is doing the right thing, would it sort of be aligned, would it be competitive? Because the procedure is trying to limit to HCH, we can try to answer the question, is HCH aligned? Is HCH competitive? Because uh, if they are, then that sort of gives us a sort of uh, upper bound, a sort of goal of, well, if the thing we're shooting for at least is, is aligned competitive, then at least we have some degree of outer alignment and performance competitiveness. Um, and there's lots of reasons, you know, it's a very complex question to try to understand, would this sort of big massive tree of humans be aligned? Would it be powerful? Would it be able to do sort of things that we want? Um, and this is sort of a big open question, but it sort of makes up a lot of the outer alignment and performance competitiveness concerns. And then we also have inner alignment and training competitiveness concerns. Uh, for inner alignment, uh, if you recall, we're trained not just on imitation, but also on this oversight. So the goal here is to try to have it so that the, uh, the overseer, which is the amplified version of the model, is able to sort of steer the training process away from the sort of domains that we're really concerned about to make sure that it doesn't, it, it sort of is in fact learning the right thing. Um, because we don't necessarily trust that if we just do gradient descent, it's going to do the right thing. And then for training competitiveness, we're trying to understand, well, so fundamentally, this is a language modeling task. And so we want to understand how competitive our machine learning tools in the future are going to be at solving these sorts of complex language modeling tasks. And we have some evidence that they are pretty good at it because we have things like GPT-3 currently that are uh, very successful at this. All right. And now, uh, who's working on this? So people who are currently working on imitative amplification, uh, so Paul Cristiano uh, sort of created the idea of amplification, um, and he is a researcher at OpenAI. Um, I work on amplification a lot. I uh, work at Miri, though I also used to work at OpenAI. Uh, also the rest of the OpenAI reflection team uh, that sort of works under Paul at OpenAI, as well as Ott, which is a sort of another organization that does sort of more human experiments trying to understand things like you know, what would HCH be like by looking at current groups of humans and how they take them. All right, so that's sort of number one, that's imitative amplification. Uh, now we'll look at number two. So number two is AI safety via debate. So what is AI safety via debate? 
So ASAF DB a debate, uh, the basic idea, we have a model and we have a copy of that model. We'll call the sort of first one Alice and the second one Bob. And we want to train those models to win debates against each other in front of a human judge. So how does this work? So if you take a look at the sort of branching argument tree on the right, we start with some question. Then Alice gets to choose how to respond to that question. Then Bob gets to sort of choose how to respond to Alice's uh, sort of answer. So Bob might sort of refute Alice's answer, provide some sort of alternative. Um, and then Alice gets to respond to Bob. And then eventually we sort of get to some leaf and the human decides, did, did Bob win, did Alice win? Um, and the idea here is that we're trying to train these models to sort of produce the most sort of relevant, honest, truthful information. Because if they do so, the hope is that, well, the human will sort of choose the model that has done the best job, that has been the most truthful, most helpful, most honest, and will incentivize that sort of helpful, honest behavior uh, via this debate process. Now, there's a couple of other things that we can do here that are nice. So, so uh, one thing that is we can't do in a sort of human debate setting, for example, but that we can do when we're doing this AI debate is we can add this sort of cross-examination. So we can allow uh, Bob, for example, to look at what Alice would have done. We can allow Bob to make a copy of Alice at a previous point in the debate and ask Alice questions. Be like, uh, maybe Alice, for example, said something that was kind of confusing. Maybe on purpose, Alice said something confusing to sort of throw Bob off. Bob can go back and ask Alice copy, a copy of Alice a question to sort of clarify and then show that answer to the human judge. Importantly, another sort of component of this is not only can sort of Bob ask Alice questions, Bob can also look internally using transparency tools or other mechanisms to sort of see is Alice sort of doing the right thing. And maybe Bob can sort of look inside Alice and show the human evidence that Alice is trying to trick the human, uh, in which case then the human might sort of pick Bob as the winner. And so this can help incentivize the models to stay honest uh, because they sort of uh, can be inspected by the other model. All right. Uh, and so now we can again sort of do some analysis, try to answer the question, uh, you know, how uh, successful, aligned, competitive would this sort of approach be? Uh, if we think about outer alignment, an important question, like I was saying previously, is the question of is honest behavior incentivized in the winner? Uh, importantly here is we're specifically trying to think about the first player, which in the previous example was Alice. Because uh, if honesty is actually the sort of dominant strategy, if sort of doing the sort of honest, helpful answer is the thing which is most likely to cause the human judge to sort of choose you, then we should hope that in the limit, we'll end up with models that are trying to uh, actually sort of produce the most honest answer because that's the thing that's most likely to be. But if the model is going to do that, then we can just ask the model what its answer would be. And we don't have to run through the whole debate when we actually want to get something out of the end. And so we want to ensure that the sort of first debater would produce a truthful answer. All right, and then for uh, inner alignment, uh, we're sort of thinking about this question of, are the debaters able to use these transparency tools to inspect and detect sort of bad things uh, happening in the other debater? Um, for training competitiveness, uh, it's interesting to think about this is in many ways a sort of self-play on uh, a sort of game setting in, in a very similar way to something like Alpha Zero. Uh, was sort of solving a game via self-play. And so there's a lot of previous examples of ways in which machine learning can successfully tackle this sort of problem. And so we might hope that this is the sort of thing that we'll be able to sort of uh, do with our machine learning tools in the future. Uh, and then performance competitiveness, there's this question of, well, how useful would a sort of superhuman debate AI, would it be able to you know, answer the, the, the sorts of questions that we need answered? And, and that's obviously sort of up to debate. Um, importantly, if uh, honesty isn't incentivizing the limit, then it also sort of might not be performance competitive because uh, it might sort of just give you bad answers. All right, then who's working on it? Uh, so AI safety via debate is due to Jeffrey Irving, who is currently at DeepMind, he used to be at OpenAI. Uh, Paul Cristiano, who's at OpenAI, also works on debate uh, quite a lot, as well as the rest of the OpenAI reflection team, which is sort of a uh, team that is sort of managed by Paul, as well as Ock, that I mentioned previously. All right, uh, next up we have recursive reward model. So what is recursive reward model? So I want to start with the sort of image in the top right, where you can see the sort of user, reward model, agent, and environment. This is describing the basic reward modeling process. The way that this works is we have some user. Uh, we can imagine it's a human, though in this setting, it's, it's not going to be just a human. We can imagine it's a human. And this human sort of is trying to give some feedback, some sort of uh, information about what it wants. 
Uh, this is fed into a reward model, which gets trained to try to predict what the human wants. And then we train an agent to try to maximize this reward model to achieve the prediction of what the human wants. Then we put this agent in an environment, we let the agent sort of run around and do things. And then the human sort of looks at what the agent is doing and gives some feedback. It's like, I like this thing that the agent was doing. I don't like this other thing that the agent was doing. And then we put that feedback back into the reward models to improve it. And then we get a better agent and so on. Now, importantly, is that that's the reward modeling process. But here we want to talk about recursive reward modeling. So what does that mean? Well, we want to take that basic procedure and recurse it. So instead of just having a human be the user, we want to instead have a human consulting an agent that was itself trained via another re reward modeling process. And so that's where you can see these sorts of multiple loops on the sort of user on the right. It's a human, but it's the human consulting another agent. And in, in many ways, this mirrors the amplification setup from previously. So the top picture is sort of identical to the bottom picture, where you can think about what we actually, what we're doing here is we have some model M0. We amplify that model to amp M0, which is the human consulting M0. And then we do reward modeling with the sort of human consulting M0 as the user. And that produces a new agent, which we'll call M1. We then amplify the new agent M1, produce sort of uh, AMP M1, which is human consulting M1, use that as the new user in a reward modeling process, get an M2, and so on. And so these are sort of these two pictures are two different ways of looking at what is fundamentally the same procedure, which is this recursive reward modeling procedure. And then in addition, we can add on top of this oversight. So similarly to what we had in amplification, we can have the amplified version of the model inspect the training process and make sure that it's sort of doing the right thing. All right. And now a question that we want to ask is, what is the limit of this procedure? So if we think about uh, what's happening when we do recursive reward modeling, where it's similar to amplification in that we sort of have this tree that we can unroll. But instead of just being a tree of humans, uh, because the sort of models were just trained to mimic the humans, and so they were sort of identical to the humans in the limit, now the models aren't trained to mimic the humans. They're trained to sort of maximally achieve the reward obtained by doing reward modeling on the humans. And so now we have a sort of the limiting tree as a human consulting models, which are trained to maximize the reward of uh, sort of obtained from doing reward modeling on a human consulting other models that were trained to maximize the reward from doing reward modeling on a human consulting and so on. And so this is a sort of reward modeling tree, recursive reward modeling tree um, that is sort of the limit of this procedure. And so now we can ask questions, uh, sort of trying to analyze this procedure similarly to previously for outer alignment. We can sort of ask is the for both outer alignment and performance competitiveness. We're going to be talking about sort of these properties of the tree. Uh, you know, is it aligned? Will we sort of like the results of this tree? And is this tree competitive? Is it sort of universal? Is it able to solve all of the different sorts of problems that we might want to be able to solve? I mean, a lot of this is going to come down to details of you know, is reward modeling successful at being able to solve a lot of these sorts of problems and sort of learn the right things. Um, and then for inner alignment, we're relying similarly to some sort of amplification, relying on this oversight where we have this overseer, which is looking at the model during training and trying to make sure that it's sort of being trained in the right way. And then for training competitiveness, we're sort of trying to understand the question, how effective would reward learning be as a sort of general purpose uh, strategy to sort of do in machine learning. And again, this is something that is sort of been proven to work at least with current machine learning tools. Um, in, in, in some settings, it's sort of a common approach that, that has been used in the literature. Uh, but there's obviously still a question of to what extent this will sort of continue to be true and be a successful approach to training machine learning systems in the future. And then we have the question of who's working on this. So people are working on this. Um, so Jan Leica, who's at DeepMind, uh, David Kruger, who uh, is at Mila, the Montreal Institute for Learning Algorithms, uh, as well as DeepMind, he's worked with uh, DeepMind as well. Uh, Tom Everett, who's at DeepMind. Um, as well as the sort of rest of DeepMind safety does a lot of work on sort of this approach or cursor word model. All right. And then for our last approach, we have microscope AI. So microscope AI is a little bit uh, sort of a different approach. So the basic idea is to train a predictive model on some data. We just want to train the model to sort of understand to be able to predict this data. And in addition, we want to sort of be using transparency tools to make sure it's actually just doing prediction. And then we take this model and we use transparency tools to understand what it learned, what sort of abstractions it built, what sort of uh, things it inferred about the causal structure of the data, about the sort of, uh, you know, all of these, the sort of things that are necessary to be able to predict and understand the data that we fed it. 
we extract those insights using transparency tools by looking inside the model and figuring out what it's doing. And then we use those insights that we gained by looking inside of the model to guide human decision making. And so we're sort of keeping the human in the loop. So Chris Ola, who's the sort of head of the Clarity team at OpenAI, has a quote about this that I think is sort of uh, really sort of useful to think about it. Chris is sort of the person who created the concept of microscope AI. So Chris says that uh, the visualizations, and here he's talking about the sort of neural network visualizations that he sort of he spends a lot of time working on. The visualizations are a bit like looking through a telescope, just like a telescope transforms the sky into something you can see. The neural network transforms the data into a more accessible form. One learns about the telescope by observing how it magnifies the night sky, but the really remarkable thing is what one learns about the stars. Similarly, visualizing representations teaches us about neural networks, but teaches us just as much, perhaps more, about the data itself. And so the idea here is that when we do visualizations, when we try to understand what a neural network is doing, we don't just learn about the neural network, we also learn about what the neural network knows. We learn about the data, we learn about the abstractions, we get ideas that can sort of help influence humans. Um, and this sort of gives us a feedback loop where we sort of uh, produce better insights that help improve human decision making, which allows us to build better AI systems and so on. And sort of keeping the human in the loop of this sort of uh, self-improvement. All right, and so now we can ask the questions, uh, sort of similar to previously, you know, how aligned and competitive would this approach be? And we think about uh, outer alignment, it's important to note microscope AI isn't really trying to be outer aligned because it's not, we're not trying to have the AI actually take actions in the world. And so it doesn't need to be the case that it's uh, objective is sort of one that if it were trying to take actions according to it would be aligned. But we do still need inner alignment because we want to ensure that the model isn't going to try to do something really weird and wacky and crazy, something totally different than what we were trying to train it for. Um, and the use of transparency tools to check the model and ensure that it's really just doing prediction is very helpful here. In addition, we can sort of talk about training dependentness. Training dependentness should be pretty straightforward. We do a lots of in machine learning currently, lots of sort of training of predictors. Um, the real sort of sticking point here is performance competitiveness, which is the question of, well, if we actually had a microscope AI, if we were able to use it to sort of improve human decision making, would that be sufficient for sort of the economic cases that we might want AI for? Um, you know, if we're, we sort of doesn't actually let us sort of obviate humans, we can't just sort of replace humans with AIs because we sort of still need a human in the loop here, but that might be sufficient at least for sort of high level decision-making like sort of AI CEOs and things like that. Um, even if it's not sufficient for sort of maybe more low level replacing sort of all jobs with AIs. All right, and so who works on microscope AI? So uh, I mentioned Chris Ola, who sort of created the concept. He uh, is a researcher at OpenAI and used to work in Google Brain. Uh, the sort of rest of OpenAI Clarity works on, uh, sort of thinks a lot about this stuff as well, uh, as, well as, other, as well as other people at Google Brain, so uh, including, for example, Shane Carter. All right, so that's sort of the four proposals that different people are working on and thinking about. And I want to sort of close with an exercise that I think is sort of useful for trying to start thinking like an AI researcher, an AI safety researcher, um, and sort of really understand uh, the sort of the pros and cons and the trade-offs here. Uh, so think about the question, if you had to recommend one of these proposals, if you were sort of, uh, you know, giving a recommendation to DeepMind or to OpenAI uh, as to like what avenue they should pursue for trying to build a sort of safe advanced AI, which would you recommend? Where would you sort of steer these, uh, these organizations to if you were sort of giving recommendations? And I think this is useful as an exercise, just sort of as a thinking tool, because it sort of helps you think about, well, you know, what would I sort of, you know, if I was actually in the position where I was sort of giving this as a recommendation, if I had to go to DeepMind and convince them to implement this, what would be the sort of best thing that I would sort of lead with that I would try to get people to focus on? And so I think this is a good sort of exercise, a good thing to think about. I'll sort of leave up the proposals that we talked about here, uh, sort of imitating application, microscope AI, recursive word modeling, and ASAP debate. Um, and again, I'll say, if you're interested in going over even more proposals, there's a sort of larger document that includes a bunch of additional proposals which you can access. Um, you can sort of see the information at the bottom of the screen, you just sort of Google for it, or I think there should be a link along with this presentation. All right, thank you so much. Uh, and you can go to, I can try to answer some questions after the talk. Thanks so much for that great talk, Evan. We'll now hear from Atya Mergel, who is a researcher at AI Impacts, a writer for the AI Alignment Newsletter, and a fund manager for the Long-Term Future Fund. She has a BA in computer science from MIT. 
Since graduating, she's worked as a trader and software engineer for Alameda Research and as a research analyst at Open Philanthropy. Hi, everybody. I'm going to be giving a talk, which I call What's Up in AI Safety. Um, my name is Asya Bergel. I do a lot of different stuff. Uh, one of the things that I do is I write for this newsletter called the AI Alignment Newsletter, which summarizes recent work in AI alignment. Uh, and I thought in the spirit of this newsletter, I could share in this talk some recent AI alignment work that I think is cool. Um, the work that I share is gonna be biased for being recent. So in the last year or so, um, it's gonna be biased for stuff that I happen to know about. Um, and I'm vaguely going to try to cover a bunch of different places that do AI alignment work. I wanna be clear that I'm not intending this talk uh, to be representative of alignment work as a whole. I'm not selecting for what I think is the most important work or anything like that. I'm really just hoping to give sort of a flavor of what alignment work looks like recently. So starting off with stuff at OpenAI, uh, Chris Ola earlier this year released an update on some work he's been doing on interpretability. Um, so interpretability generally is basically this property that we'd like to have where we'd like to be able to know what's going on inside of our neural networks. Generally, neural networks are modeled as black boxes, um, but we'd like to know what's happening inside of them because then we could verify that they aren't doing things that are wrong or bad. Um, so in this work, Chris Ola basically tries and succeeds at decomposing neural networks into their constituent pieces, um, where those pieces are individual neurons and their functionality, and the structure is composed of individual neurons, which he calls circuits. Uh, so this picture is sort of showing one of these decompositions, um, a neural network that's trying to detect a car is decomposed into its constituent parts, which detect windows, a car body, and wheels of that car. Um, and one cool thing that Chris postulates uh, sort of doing this work is that the insights that you get, you know, looking at the structure of one neural network actually transfer to other neural networks. Um, so we should expect neural networks, especially ones that are doing similar things, to have very similar structures. Um, and this sort of fact is actually a really just encouraging fact for interpretability as a whole, because it means, you know, we have some hope of understanding future neural networks without having to do, you know, all of the interpretability work from scratch. Um, so yeah, I think this is very cool work. Uh, elsewhere in OpenAI, Beth Barnes released an update on progress on AI safety via debate. Um, so debate is this proposed mechanism for being able to oversee and evaluate future AIs. Um, so we have this problem if we do want to oversee and evaluate future AIs where humans are going to be significantly less smart and significantly less fast than those AIs. Um, so we don't really have the time or brain power to check every single move that they do to make sure you know, it's not bad, they're not trying to trick us or being unhelpful. Um, so the idea behind debate is, you know, maybe one way we can hope to try to evaluate them um, is if we actually have a group of AIs um, where other AIs job is to try and, you know, poke holes in or otherwise identify the failures um, or wrongdoings of other AIs. Um, so it's kind of unclear what this high level mechanism would actually look like and whether it would work. Um, and one way to try to get at whether it would work is to try to look at an analogous case in humans. Um, so the analogous case in humans maybe looks like, you know, we have a non-expert human that would like to evaluate and oversee the behavior of expert humans. Um, so one way we can get at that is to try to have the expert humans debate each other, you know, put holes in their own arguments um, and see if the non-expert humor, see if the non-expert human comes away with that, um, with sort of the right conclusion about whatever question they're debating about. Um, so Beth Barnes has been basically doing empirical work, testing this mechanism. Um, she's been running debates. Uh, she's been trying to break those debates by having, you know, the experts do weird stuff that might trick the non-expert. Um, and then she's been trying to design new mechanisms to make it so that uh, the incentives of the experts are such that, you know, the non-expert can't be fooled or otherwise misled. Um, so yeah, very cool work from OpenAI is still in progress. Um, ask for Beth if you want more updates. Uh, other work from DeepMind, there's a new paper that Victoria Krakowna released along with some other people called Avoiding Side Effects by Considering Future Tasks. Um, so one thing we would like AIs not to do is we would not like them to have catastrophic side effects in pursuit of their goals. 
Um, so, you know, if you tell an AI that you want it to get you a jar of peanut butter, um, you would like it to do that in a very chill way, not by, you know, destroying supermarkets or something like that. Um, but it's actually kind of difficult to know how to specify in the general case that you don't want your AI to do random bad things. Um, the work sort of trying to do this often goes by the heading of impact measures. Uh, but the idea in this paper is, you know, one way that maybe we can specify this in the general case is by rewarding the AI if it's still possible to complete some future tasks after it takes whatever action it takes. Um, so the idea is, you know, if after getting you that jar of peanut butter, you know, the AI is still able to do a bunch of other things in the world, then we can hope that maybe it hasn't messed up the world too badly. Um, so yeah, please go look at the paper if you want more detail on this. I'm definitely not doing it justice. Um, but yeah, very cool recent work from Victoria Krakowna. Next, I wanted to mention a paper from the Machine Intelligence Research Institute written by Evan Hubinger called Risks from Learned Optimization. Um, this paper itself actually isn't as recent as the other work in this talk, um, which most of the other work is from 2020. This is from 2019. Um, but I wanted to mention it, one, because I think it really sort of formalizes and pins down a lot of ideas that have been floating around the AI safety community for a while. Uh, and two, because I think there's sort of been a lot of follow-up discussion from this all over the last year. It's definitely a very live topic in AI safety communities. Um, so the basic idea behind this paper, I think, can best be explained via analogy to evolution. Uh, so evolution is this optimizing process um, in the course of optimizing for genetic fitness, it produced humans. And humans are themselves optimizers um, that might be optimizing for goals that are not genetic fitness. So, you know, maybe they're optimizing for getting food, maybe they're optimizing for beauty or truth or love, um, or something that's not just, you know, reproducing as much as possible and spreading their genes. Um, so the idea behind this paper is, you know, similar to how humans are sort of now optimizing for things outside of what evolution originally you know, cared about, um, we could expect machine learning systems to do a similar thing. Um, so you know, machine learning systems are trained using gradient descent, um, which is sort of this outer optimizer. Uh, and then inside of them, we have this neural network. That neural network could be doing a lot of things. One of the things it could be doing is itself acting as an optimizer. Um, and that optimizer might evolve to have goals outside of the original goals that are specified. So Evan calls sort of potential failures from that optimization, MESA optimization failures. Uh, and this paper goes into detail characterizing the circumstances where we might expect failures like this to occur um, and just really being exact about what these failures would look like. Next, we have work from the Center for Human Compatible AI. Um, there's a paper called Quantifying Differences in Reward Functions by Adam Gleave and a bunch of other people. Uh, so one sort of recent strain of thought in AI work um, is the idea of reward learning. Um, so the basic problem is, you know, the preferences that humans have are kind of difficult to specify, and we shouldn't expect that we're generally just able to, you know, hard code a single function somewhere that says exactly what we want. Um, you know, maybe a more promising and more practical solution um, is that we'd like the AI systems that we have to be able to learn what human preferences are, and that's what reward learning refers to. Um, so one thing you need to do when you're doing reward learning um, is you need to be able to compare potential reward functions that you're using to express human preferences. Um, so maybe, you know, you want to see which of two reward functions is best, um, or you want to, you know, trial a procedure for producing a reward function by comparing that reward function to some ground truth reward function. Um, so, so far, the way that you do this comparison between reward functions is you train a policy using both of those reward functions. Um, then you have that policy, you know, suggest some actions and compare those actions, compare the results of that policy. Um, the problem is that this basically is just comparing, you know, two training runs. Um, and, you know, there could be a lot of details that are very specific to that training run uh, that don't actually bear on the goodness of the overall reward function. Um, so this paper actually suggests a way of comparing reward functions directly. It introduces a new metric called EPIC, which lets you do that and suggests that you know, future work uh, could use that to compare reward functions. Um, yeah, very cool work out of Chai. Um, I also in this talk wanted to mention a bunch of independent research that people have been doing uh, that, you know, it maybe isn't as formal as sort of an academic paper, um, but I think it's really good work that's sort of advancing the state of the art. 
Um, most of this work happens, or at least the one stuff that I see happens on the alignment forum, which I'll talk about more at the end. Um, it's basically just a super welcoming place uh, that collates a lot of recent alignment work and gives people sort of the opportunity to post their own ideas about a alignment. Um, so one recent sort of good series I think out of there has been John Wentz works work on abstraction. Uh, so abstraction in general um, is sort of he suggests this field about how we can make predictions about the world while you know understanding what information um, we want to keep and what information we want to throw away. So we'd like to make predictions. We have a lot of messy info, you know, in order to make predictions in you know a computationally tractable way. Um, we need to be able to sort of make sense of that info and know what to look at and what not to look at. Um, and he sort of suggests that this might be part of the solution uh, to a very thorny class of problems um, called embedded agency problems. Um, the idea here is, you know, whatever is going on with our future AI systems, we're going to have an agent that's going to need to reason about it and its environment. Uh, and its environment will actually also contain the agent itself. So in some sense here, it's reasoning about itself. Um, and that always sort of leads to tricky and thorny problems in computer science. Um, and John sort of suggests that digging more into sort of abstraction as a field um, might yield some solutions to these problems or some understanding. And then other independent work recently that I thought was cool was work from Richard No. He started a sequence on the safety of multi-agent systems. Um, so the idea here is we often think of safety problems in the context of one agent with one goal, um, you know, one AI system doing some stuff. Um, but, you know, in humans, actually, sort of the most interesting capabilities and behavior come when you put humans in groups, um, you know, all sorts of interactions and culture and intelligence that evolves out of these sort of group dynamics. Um, and Richard suggests that maybe a similar thing is going to happen um, with AI systems where sort of the most interesting and capable and even dangerous behavior um, might happen when you think about their group interactions. Um, so in this sort of start of a sequence, Richard is thinking about sort of how we can shape um, the agents in the system and how we can incentivize them to be safe, um, even in this sort of weird group environment. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is that there is actually a bunch of sort of other academic work that's not affiliated necessarily with any of these orgs um, that I think is great for AI safety. Um, a lot of recent work on robustness, basically getting AI systems to do what we train them to do. Um, in unexpected circumstances. I don't follow this work as closely as I follow all the other stuff. Um, so I don't wanna say too much about something I don't really know that much about. Um, but there is a bunch of recent work here. Um, I think it's you know very true that academia does work that's good for safety overall. Um, and yeah, here are a bunch of recent robustness papers um, that other people basically recommended to me uh, for people who are interested in this. Okay, hopefully that talk wasn't too overwhelming. Um, I do want to point to sort of three things that you could look at if you were interested in learning more about this stuff. One is you could go to the tiny URL link um, at the bottom of this presentation, which gives more details about all of the stuff that I covered here. Um, another thing you could do is go and hang out on the alignment forum, which I mentioned, um, which yeah, I think is a very welcoming uh, sort of place for newcomers and for sort of existing seasoned AI safety veterans to discuss their ideas and to look at past work. Um, and sort of lastly, I did want to plug the alignment newsletter that I write for, uh, which I think does a good job of keeping people up to date with recent alignment work. It takes, definitely makes me feel like I'm up to date and hopefully it can do the same for you. Thanks again for those great talks, Asya and Evan. Um, so I see we have a number of questions submitted. Um, so we'll kick off with the first one for Evan. Um, so Evan, with respect to the four key alignment strategies that you talked about, to what extent have these um, models been successfully implemented already? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. I think there's a couple of things that I can say there. So one thing that I'll say is that all of the proposals that I talked about are sort of intended to be proposals which scale. The idea is not just to be able to you know, implement these things now, but to have an idea for how we might be able to take these proposals and you know, keep working on them and improving them as we get more and more intelligent and more powerful machine learning systems. That being said, there is a lot of work that can be done right now to try to understand and analyze what these proposals will look like in the future. So for each one of the proposals that I've talked about, there are people that are working on trying to implement this in current machine learning systems. So uh, debate and amplification and microscope AI are all being worked on, like I mentioned at OpenAI. 
Uh, the OpenAI Reflection team, for example, recently released a paper where they are trying to uh, do a sort of mini version of amplification debate to try to just sort of fine tune GPT-3 to sort of better be able to answer you know, specific human questions. Uh, and recursive word modeling, also there's lots of work there that's done in DeepMind. And so all of these things do have an extent to which we can try to work on it now, but it's worth keeping in mind that the major goal of all of these is to try to make sure that they scale well into the future, not just that they're, we're able to implement them now. So it seems like there's several organizations that have kind of taken a first step, but with the understanding that this will continue to be a strategy to be worked on in the future too. That's right. Cool. Um, okay, next question. Um, so someone asked, what are some of these transparency tools that we're talking about? So I, again, I think Evan, this was mentioned a little bit in your talk, but Asya, you also talked about this with some of Chris Ola's work. Are there other examples that you can also point to? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, sort of like the rest of this stuff, transparency tools are sort of like um, something we would like to have and, and people are actively working on. Um, yeah, Chris Ola does a lot of, of work on this. Um, you know, I think in general, yeah, there's uh, sort of the Clarity team does a lot of work trying to um, basically think of ways to sort of like visualize and decompose um, neural networks. Uh, there's definitely sort of like a question of, um, you know, how much these methods scale and, and how much they transfer to, you know, various things that we might want to know about. Um, so yeah, Crisola's work has been largely on um, image classifiers. Um, you know, it's not clear if it's easy to sort of do the same thing um, with stuff like language models. Um, but there is also just like other sort of strands of interpretability work, um, stuff called dynamical systems analysis. Um, I think there are lots of people sort of trying to think of ways to approach the problem of uh, figuring out what a neural network is doing. Um, but there is sort of like a big overarching question of uh, to what extent like any of these methods scale and to what extent, you know, they're easy to apply um, in, in domains that aren't sort of as easy to, to visualize as something like an image classifier. Right, so similar to Evan's answer, um, a good first step has been taken, but lots of work that needs to be done. That's totally right, yeah. Um, another question for Evan. So what's the difference between imitative amplification and iterative amplification? And similarly, someone else asks, how does the first step of IDA work? How does a human do the initial value training? Can you shed some light on either of those? Yeah, so I'll try to clear some of this stuff up. So first thing that's worth noting is that the term iterated amplification is more general. So the term iterated amplification refers to any form of amplification that is doing this sort of basic process of, you know, take a model, amplify it, uh, and then sort of train some new model based on that amplified version via some sort of distillation process. So for example, both recursive reward modeling and imitative amplification that I talked about in my talks would be forms of the general approach of iterated amplification. Imitative amplification specifically refers to the form of amplification where what you do is you take the amplified model and then you just train the model to imitate the amplified version, uh, which is the sort of first proposal that I talked about. Um, and then remind me what the second question was. So the second question says, how does step one of IDA work? How does a human do the initial value training? Great. So yeah, this is a good question. I think in terms of, if we try to think about amplification, there is this problem of how do we get off the ground initially? And one thing that is important to keep in mind that I didn't really talk about in my talk is that one of the main uses for something like amplification is not just to train an AI from scratch, but to take an existing AI, for example, a language model that was trained via a sort of autoregressive uh, language modeling regime, something like GPT-3, and then to turn that language model into something which is like actually helpful and able to sort of assist humans. So the idea with a lot of these proposals, including debate and uh, sort of imitative amplification, isn't necessarily to start from scratch, but to try to start from something like uh, an autoregressive language model like GPT-3, but that, you know, something like GPT-3 isn't actually trying to be helpful to you. It's just trying to sort of complete the next uh, sort of word that it predicts and try to turn something like that into something that's actually going to be helpful, that's going to try to assist the human. And so uh, in terms of like, how do we get things off the ground? What is the sort of first step? Well, in a lot of these cases, the first step would be take an existing autoregressive language model and then apply these techniques to that. One person also asks, um, what's a currently neglected project in this space? So I guess um, going back to these questions of, you know, initial steps have been implemented, but there definitely is a lot of work done that um, for these models to scale. Are there, I guess, like specific projects or topics that you can talk about to help a student uh, kind of get started in this area? Um, that's a great question. So I think that there's definitely a lot of work to be done on all of these things. So, you know, both me and Asia talked about interpretability. That's definitely a place where I think there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, in particular, if you head over to distill.pub, there's a whole bunch of articles that you can see there, including uh, like a bunch of, uh, they talk about a lot of sort of future work there. 
Um, there's also a lot of future work to be done just in terms of trying to take these approaches and understand better how they're going to work, how they're going to scale into the future. Um, as well as, you know, in particular, one thing is trying to understand what, what are these sorts of training processes like? What are these uh, are sort of the inner alignment actually going to go through with this? And so one of the things that one of the sorts of experiments that I might be excited about is trying to understand um, how good are these training processes? How good are sort of the ability to, you know, inspect the training process as it's going along? And can we produce examples of cases where we try to train on like some particular objective, like irritative amplification, for example, and we end up with a model which is maybe trying to do something different. So I've, I've written about this a little bit. Um, in the past, I have a, a post called uh, sort of towards a um, concrete experiments for inner alignment, I believe, that sort of provides an example of, you know, what would a like simple experiment look like to try to demonstrate the existence of inner alignment failures. Um, and Asya sort of talked about this a little bit when she was talking about the, the paper that I was author on risk learned optimization. Um, and one of the sorts of places where I'd be most excited about sort of new experiments is, is in that space is trying to understand what are these sorts of uh, robustness failures look like when you start scaling up systems. Kind of a similar question to Atia. Um, Atia, in your uh, work with the Long-Term Future Fund, can you maybe talk about what um, sorts of projects grant makers are looking to fund or what they'd be excited about in an independent researcher? Um, yeah, I mean, I definitely don't want to speak for the whole fund, so I can only um, speak for myself. Um, yeah, I think, you know, uh, sort of independent research is always tricky. Like, it's sort of hard to make progress as an independent researcher. Um, so I think in terms of, in terms of, like, wanting to make progress as an independent researcher, I think sort of the things that I look for and think are sort of the most promising are, you know, like having a good sense of what's already been written in the space, um, you know, suggesting research directions that seem uh, tractable and, and meaningful. Um, and then also just, you know, being willing and, and able to engage with other researchers in the space. I think that's sort of very important. Um, and all of this work, you know, um, it's very much sort of like a collaborative field and, and lots of people are, are sort of, you know, constantly talking about these ideas and making progress and suggestions. Um, so to the extent that, that you can sort of get involved with people already working on it, I think that's that's really good. Okay, and we have a couple of minutes left, so we'll end with a final question. Um, so Evan and Asya, you guys are uh, kind of approaching AI safety from different paths. So Evan, um, definitely more technical research and Asya a little bit more broad strategy focus. Um, can you um, talk a little bit about how you got onto that path and you know whether you have any tips on whether this could be a good fit for another student? Maybe you can start with Asya. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, I sort of um, dropped into this work by accident. Like, I, I don't know if I made a lot of like super uh, intentional choices, um, but I ended up doing a lot of forecasting work and then um, I got like much more into it via working at AI Impact. Um, I think for safety stuff in particular, I mean, I had a, I guess I had a computer science background um, and I sort of saw, you know, advertisements for people to help write the newsletter that I'm a part of. Um, and I think basically maybe what that should suggest to students is that um, I think as Buck said in an earlier talk here is that, you know, the field is not so deep um, that you need a whole lot of experience to engage with it. Um, so I think if you seem if it's if this stuff seems kind of interesting, um, it's very possible um, for people with not that much background to sort of get up to speed to understand what's going on, um, to have their own ideas. Um, so maybe that's sort of like I think the takeaway maybe from my career trajectory is, um, you know, you don't have to be like some absurd super genius to get involved in this stuff. Um, I think it's really possible um, to sort of know what's going on with a, with a less specific background. Yeah, I mean, I definitely like what Ossie is saying. In, in terms of my background, so uh, I sort of got very involved in effective altruism when I was in college. Um, and I wasn't exactly sure sort of how to, you know, deploy my skills, how to, you know, find a career which would make the sort of largest impact. But I sort of went to an EA Global and I went to this um, workshop called AI Risk for Computer Scientists. Um, and I ended up, uh, as a result of some of this sort of stuff, uh, doing an internship at Miri, um, which was sort of really good. I think that one of the things that was nice about that was just sort of getting my foot in the door and really sort of just starting to meet people and understand what's happening in AI safety. And while I was there, I also attended this thing, the Miri Summer Fellows Program, which is sort of a couple week long research retreat. Um, and I met a couple of other people and we were sort of very interested in, in what was then being called optimization demons and became this sort of inner alignment problem, which was resulted in us writing this paper, risk learned optimization, which was very well received. And this sort of like was sort of put me in a position where I was like felt comfortable doing research and being able to do research. Um, and so after that, I applied and did some work at OpenAI. And then after OpenAI, I went to Miri, which is where I am now. 
Okay, well, that's all the time we have for questions. Thanks again so much to Atia and Evan, um, and thanks to all of our viewers for watching. Um, to our viewers, before you leave the session, please give us your feedback in the poll section of the live chat. Thanks again.